All right. Before we get too started, can we get a volunteer to Jabberscribe and a volunteer to take some notes? Quick, everybody look away. <laughs> Be sure to look at the remote attendees. They can hear. Yes. So what exactly does a Jabber scribe do in the current situation? Well, the traditional mode for anyone who is text only and listening to the remote audio stream question mark. Yeah, uh, which I can do that. <laughs> No, it's actually useful that we've had a few sessions this week where someone's audio, like just we couldn't hear them. Their microphone was on the frets, so they said that I can be I can be JavaScript. I think Ted was also volunteering, but thank you, Ted. Who would like to take some notes? Somebody want to bite the bullet? Can we get two people to take notes and back each other up? Sometimes it's a little less intimidating if you have a partner in crime. Yeah, you're, you're about to be in front of here. Thank you very much. Minimum is anything that we appear to decide and outcomes from different questions and so conversations. Don't try to no need to transcribe. It's all on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thank you very much, sir. All right, with that out of the way, let's get started. Welcome to MASK at IETF 114. This is the first in-person-ish meeting of the MASK Working Group. We had one in Vienna. That's the ish part. Um, <coughs> diving right in. This session is being recorded. It will be on YouTube. Anything you say will be visible and audible to everyone else in the world. Uh, make sure that you have already joined via the on-site tool if you're here in person, if you're here remotely via the video stream, you already know where that link leads. As usual, you can get into the queue by raising your hand and leaving it by lowering your hand. And you can start and stop sending audio. Please state your full name before speaking and use headphones if remote. This is the IETF note well. You've already seen it by this point in the week, but please take a moment to make sure that you are familiar with we do. Make sure that you're familiar with the note well. This, these are the terms under which we participate in the ITF. 
pay extra attention to the parts about the code of contact and how we treat ourselves and others. In addition, if you are here in the room at ITF 114, there is a mask policy in effect. You must be wearing a legitimate and good mask. If you do not have one, they are out at registration. You can just go pick one up. We have some fun, helpful links. This is mostly useful if you can actually click on them. And this is our agenda for today. We have a bunch of stuff. So we're gonna start off by talking about Connect IP and moving some of that forward, hopefully in a pretty big way. And then we've got some new work that's being proposed in the form of a couple different individual drafts from different people. And at the end, we're gonna take some time and talk about rechartering because our current charter takes us right through the end of Connect IP and stops there. With that, Tommy, let's talk about Connect IP. Okay. Do you want to have your phone present some slides, or do you want me to click for you? Um, let's see. Let's try this thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right, I'm already oh, on nice. QR codes, so I'm asking to share slides. Yep. Perfect. Are you going to approve me? Yes, indeed. Uh, no, I, I granted it. It should just take it. Yeah. <laughs> Could you just click through? That's hilarious. Click it again. Did you grant? Did, you, did anyone select uh, which? It doesn't actually give you a place to select. Oh, here we go. There you go. Okay. Much better. All right. Cool. Can I control it? Yes, I can. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tommy Polly from Apple, and I am editing. The Connect IP document, we have many authors. Uh, so thank you to the authors. If you recall from previous times, this was a joint effort of bringing different proposals together um, into one unified Connect IP. Um, earlier this week, we did have a meeting of the authors to try to hammer out some of the issues. And so the majority of this presentation will be trying to talk about the issues, we think we have resolutions for all of them, but we would like to get feedback from the room on that to see if there's anything we missed or things that we don't actually agree on. And hopefully we can actually go and merge all the pull requests and make some progress. So get excited, everyone. Um, but before that, we do have some updates on testings and implementations. Uh, so. <laughs> Uh, there was a CAC IP table at the hackathon. I myself was not there because I was on an airplane, but I was dutifully hacking on Connect IP on the airplane. Um, so uh, Connect IP implementations were being made in several uh, places on several different um, code bases. I don't think we've done cross implementation interop yet, but uh, a lot of work was going on and we've learned things from trying to implement. David. Oh, sorry, I forgot to join the queue, David Skazi. Just to add from the hackathon folks, we were very darn close to interop, but everyone was realizing the, oh, implementing the mask bit is easy. Implementing the, please kernel, take this packet and put it where it's supposed to go is way less easy. So mask, uh, Magnus did a uh, good uh, summary at the hack uh, end of the hackathon. And kind of what we said is we're gonna finish this and reach and drop in the coming weeks. And for the next hackathon in London, we plan to arrive having figured out the silly tunnel interfaces so we can really focus on the protocol stuff. Thanks. Yep, but uh, good, good progress was made all around. So thanks to everyone who was contributing to that. And we had lots of people who weren't authors on it. So thank you to all of them. All right, so first, just to summarize some of the recent changes um, in the latest version of the published draft, we had done work to try to improve text around uh, how you handle the URI templates. A lot of this is lifted from Connect UDP as Connect UDP finalized, so we want to make sure we had parity there. We had issues with how address assign worked, uh, when is that required or not, and so we tried to clarify that. We talked about the fact that ICMP is a good way to communicate errors. Um, and we also talked about how to uh, 
make sure you had enough MTU for your IPv6 traffic. So these are all good changes, but as you will see, a lot of the issues that we uh, currently have open that uh, we're trying to resolve are follow-ons to these. So a lot of it's in the kind of the same space, things that we realized were still left open. Alrighty, to get into the actual issues, um, the numbers up here are the GitHub issues. I have kind of all the, the content here to talk about in slides, but feel free to also look at the GitHub issues. And if we want to get really in depth, maybe we can switch over at some point. All right, so the oldest issue we have is one just talking about, you know, do we need a default URI template? Uh, kind of this was raised by the fact that Connect UDP has one. It defined this uh, well-known mask UDP. Um, and the structure of that seemed to imply that you could put other things under uh, this well-known slash mask. And so there's just kind of a question of, you know, do we need this for Connect IP? Um, I think there's you know good debate back and forth. Uh, in our last discussion, the authors kind of agreed that it actually probably does make sense because there are going to be cases where you may be referring to a generic relay proxy box just by a name. Um, and while it is you know very obvious that a browser that may only have a space for a name will definitely want to be able to do connect and connect UDP. There are use cases where it may need to do connect IP as well. Um, so there doesn't seem to be a reason to limit um, it from doing this. And so we just essentially have the exact same text that connect UDP has for connect IP to have the default uh, URI template for that. Um, in this case, the two parameters there are the target that you want to connect to, as well as the IP protocol that you want. And the default for both of these is just star and star for uh, wildcards, which is already something that is supported by the URI template. Um, thoughts here, any objections to having this be defined? Of course, no one has to use it. You can, it's probably better to use a more specific one if you have a mechanism for that, but for the same reason that Connect UDP had the support for just the host name, it seemed fairly clear to be parallel. Martin Thompson. It's great. You can see when people are going to get in queue before they actually get in queue because they pick up their phone and they tap a button. Hey, tell me. Hello. You're using well known again. Yeah, but this doesn't actually have to create a new well known registration. It just updates the one that Connect UDP made. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about that as well. <laughs> sure. I mean, yeah. That's the uh, part of it. Um, but it's just like if we already so, did this for Connect UDP. So I, I, I think this, this goes to the um, the question of how you plan to configure these things. Yep. Um, and because you need a a URI, what is it, pattern or um, yep. template? Template. Jeez, my brain's completely dribbling out the back. You of need my head to know the path and the parameters. Problem. Yeah. Um, that provides a really useful way of distinguishing this from um, the other things you might put in a con in configuration because you have domain names in some, in some cases and what appears to be something like a URI in, in those other cases. Yeah. So I, I tend to think that essentially requiring people to use the full template configuration is a better choice. Uh, and I, why, I guess, why is this different from Connect UDP then? It's not, which is but, so okay. You, you just happen to be the first one to put it up on the slides. I, th I th okay. I mean, I think we came to consensus on it for Connect UDP previously, and that was discussed in the group. Uh, okay. Well, so essentially, it's like I don't see a good reason for this to go out of its way to no, not no. use the well-known that Connect UDP already established. I, I guess if 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 we're going with precedent, then fine. That's <laughs> yeah, it, and like. I agree that using a template, like if, you know, if we use, if we have something like what Ben has for his directory, like, great, use that. But if you don't have that, I don't see a harm in this. David Skenazi, not really a well-known enthusiast. Um, <laughs> but you are a well-known mask enthusiast. Yeah. <laughs> nice. So I'm realizing that the chairs forgot a slight update 
which is since the last IETF, HTTP datagrams and Connect UDP were, went through IETF last call, were approved by the IESG, and are now in the RFC editor's queue, which yes. means that those documents are pretty much done. It also means that we can't change them, which is great. But well, I mean, yeah. all 48. You no, 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but anyway. Yeah. So anyway, that's really great. Like th that was the first deliverable of the working group, which is yes. great. We Ooh. all did that together. Hooray. Um, but yeah, the two. No, <laughs> <laughs> that will cost you. <laughs> exactly. So we better agree on this. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, the, the argument that convinced me uh, as well was that it's, it's consistent. So, yeah. yep, chip it. But thank you, David, for that note. That is a very good point. We have two of our three main documents have now progressed and that is wonderful. Uh, hey, Ben Schwartz. So uh, I, I sort of reluctantly agreed to the inclusion of this template in Connect UDP. Uh, and, uh, and so I can, I can reluctantly agree to the similar inclusion here. Exactly, that's uh, exactly the same book. If necessary, uh, but I do think it's like, I don't think it was a very good idea there. I think it's a, a little bit worse idea here um, in particular, Connect UDP, uh, when in, in the, the Connect UDP draft, the one that, that's in off, uh, that, that's in the in RC RC editor's queue, uh, always has a target. Um, this yeah. draft, in my understanding, does not. Uh, Connect IP does not necessarily have a target. Now, Connect UDP also has recently, uh, well, is, is uh, hopefully about to gain support for, for non-target requests as well so there that will be somewhat parallel for listener style for listener yeah, style. Yeah. yes um yeah because we need web but, rtc but work. but uh this this has some weird effects here like the, the draft currently says the target is an uh, the, the target parameter may be specified in, uh in when when populating the template but that actually yeah. has to be changed so this, this makes in, the in target the PR, in the pr it essentially says this default one always has it but the existing text on the on the template and the parameters says that uh, star is equivalent to empty. I, I understand that. I'm, yeah. I'm just saying you're, you're no longer actually following the URI template engine rules because the URI mm -hmm. template engine rules say that the target variable can be unspecified in the inputs to your template, in which case the rendering engine will do something. And in this case, what it will do is give you a pair of slashes back to back, right? But, but so it will not like the, the update to the text right is that in general regardless of actually the well known or not if your uri template puts these parameters within the path segment and not the query segment of parameters because there are the two flavors you can do there right. that are allowed for this if they're in the path one then you must not have it be empty you must have it be a star so well, that's even worse right. um, because that means that now I have to introspect inside the, like as a client, I get a, a URI template back and I have my variables that I want to substitute into it. I can't just take my URI template and my variables and hand them to a URI template engine. I actually have to go disassemble the template and figure out which, which template structure is being used here in order to figure out whether I need to I mean, I think do that's this, kind of a this problem. asterisk replacement. So that's a problem if we allow them being in the path at all. Uh, Regardless I agree, of well but it, uh, it's it's uh, it's not it's not a problem even in this case. And, you know, you can have empty path segments in HTTP. Oh, you, you just do slash slash. You would just have slash slash. Mm -hmm. I'm just telling you slash, that slash, it, slash. Sure. it's it's ugly and that it creates weirdness uh, if you have this now ambiguity of like sometimes it's star or sometimes it's empty string. Uh, you could also just make it always be star and disallow empty string. And in which case you're saying the target parameter is, is always there. And like, yes, that's must, fine. Yeah. That, I think okay. that's a perfectly fine okay. resolution. And the other thing is, um, IP fine. proto is that, is that, um, sorry, what is IP? That's proto? the IP protocol number. Uh, okay. Which can be anything, or you can say, no, I only want to open up for this. Okay. Like I, I want ICMP only. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In that case, uh, I mean, well, anyway, we have, there's some, there's some, some fiddliness that, that needs yeah. to be sorted out there. Okay. Okay. Martin. Yeah, so if, if you put the slash inside the curly braces, things got, get interesting um, and may solve the problem here, uh, provided that your 
target and protocol, um, provided that you don't have a protocol if you don't have a target. So if you get the order right. Uh, but what if you said, I want to open up everything that does ESP because I want to run IPsec over this, but I don't, I want to send it to everywhere, but I only care okay. about this protocol. So, so you are saying that you could have one or both with BMT. the one being either the wild one card. of them. Yes. Yeah, that, that doesn't work then. So um, it turns out if you, if you read RFC, what's, it called, what's the number again? 6570? The UI template one? Yeah, there's a bunch of ways you can spin this. Um, Joy. <laughs> and perhaps that should have been the case for the other one anyway. Um, but essentially what you do is you put the, the slash inside the, the, um, the curly braces. And so it, you do it target path, slash IP it will, proto. It, it will make the path component optional at that point. I see. So you don't need double slashes. So you wouldn't end up with double slashes or stars or any other sort of weird gobbledygook in there. You just, if you have a target, then that, then that component is added. If you have a, a, a protocol, then that's added. The only problem there is that no. you need, in the case where both of them are optional, then you have to have some way of distinguishing between right. the two of them, which is kind of awkward. Yeah. Uh, and we could also just go the, it's always there and you just put a star when you want it to be open-ended. Yeah, okay. To make it very explicit that like, hey, I'm trying to open up a full tunnel VPN here. I'll, I'll need to have a look at the URI grammar before I can say that I'm comfortable with that. Sure, that's fine. Uh, David Skenazi, like I, I did a bunch of reading and please correct me if I misread to figure out if like slash slash was allowed or star was allowed. And when it came down to is slash slash inside the path is allowed, but there's a bunch of software that normalizes it and then it's going to remove one slash and then you're going to have a sad day. So we should avoid slash slash and star seemed fine. Um, what the reason I'm okay with the text as it currently is because Ben has a valid concern that you don't want the, the implementation of this that's using a generic URI template library to have to figure out if they're in the path or not. But in that case, you just always put a star. Like you're gonna have this variable or anyway. it knows it has a or it knows it has a target that it's going to. Like it knows what to fill in. It, exactly. So okay. I you know, at the end of the day, yeah, it's kind of fugly, but at least it's consistent with Connect UDP, whatever. How about, so what I would propose here is this, like, I think this particular issue we have agreed, like, you know, we don't love the well-known, but like it's consistent. So like we kind of, we came to agreement on that. This other issue that Ben brought up, I think is a separate, a separate issue of like having the stuff in the path component and being ambiguous about, can it be empty? Can it be a star or like having it be different between where it is and that like, that's the grossness. So could we open up a new issue to essentially just determine if do you like, do we really allow empty and that variability between empty and star? Well, the, the reason to allow empty is that if you're using a level three URI template, and this is why everyone should be going <laughs> wide eyed and it's your, I hate URI templates, but we decided that that's what we wanted to use is so the level three, because these are like Pokemon for some reason, <laughs> is that you can specify a question mark target yeah. and it'll say, if it's empty, it won't do anything. And if it's there, it'll do question mark target equals what you put in. Yeah. And so that ability to save those bytes is kind of neat. Like at the end of the day, whatever, four star, who cares? Uh, just whatever simplest to implement. Or, or, maybe, or maybe, we, yeah, we decide that like, like the other way you do it is like if you recognize like it's always technically star, but like if you recognize in the query string that you're about to put something equal star, you can just drop it on the floor if you don't want to spend the bytes on it. Which, which is it's the same thing. Uh, what the current PR does. Yes. And that's why I like it. It's it's simple. Yeah, this is this is gross. This is not the grossest thing we've done. It's not the grossest thing we will do. Me. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. Here we go. Okay, sounds good. Um, so I think it warrants a bit more discussion just to make sure we're happy with that, but this particular issue seems okay. Next one. Um, so we had a couple different issues around some of the new text that I was talking about ensuring we had enough MTU. Um, previously, the text 
provided three different options, I believe, for how you validate you have enough MTU to get things like minimum IPv6 packets through. And like one way was you know you have a direct connection from the client to the proxy. There's nothing else in between you. You know you padded your initial quick to a large enough size. You know you have room in the datagrams and then you don't need to do anything else to make sure you have a minimum MTU. I think there was a middle one that was trying to say like, oh, you may have intermediaries. And if you coordinate sufficiently with your intermediaries to make sure you have enough MTU, then this could also work. And then the fail safe was if you can't guarantee that you don't have intermediaries and that they have enough room for your minimum size packets, you should do some ICMP through this to make sure that you have sufficient path MTU. Um, intermediaries are messy and gross. And so as we were talking, we were like, eh, let's try to just like, maybe let's just ditch the text that says, oh, maybe you could coordinate with your intermediary. So we just say like, either you guarantee from end to end that you have a big enough quick connection to hold your minimum size, or you do path M2 to discovery through the tunnel. And that's it for this. Ben is going to get in the queue once he can press the button. Oh, Gory, hello. Hiya. Yeah. Um, I wondered if we need to be a little bit careful with A, since we're tunneling other things, um, because the path property could change. And whilst that's OK and known for quick, it's not known for the protocols all for quick. Do we need to word around that in some way? Sorry. Okay. No, can, can, can you just repeat, David, if you understood and you have a response, I'd like to get. To, to answer Gori's question, uh, David Skenazi here. Um, it's, let's say you have an end-to-end -end quick connection and you start with adding quick initials to uh, 13, whatever the number is in there, uh, um, yes. you, you'll be fine. Uh, yep. But if you implement uh, dynamic PMTUD inside quick yes. and your quick MTU goes down to something below that, then you need to nuke the connect IP stream. Maybe we just need to add a sentence for that. Because our implementation yes. doesn't do dynamic PMTUD, so we don't have this problem. But if you if you do, I'm just adding a sentence saying if you detect that your MTU goes lower, like we don't, actually we don't, we don't think we need to say anything because we already have text that says if you detect that the MTU is not sufficient, you have to nuke the tunnel. But anyway. so if you're not doing dynamic PMTUD, that means you start out with your initial size, but that's not a guarantee that subsequent packets yeah. that you're sending make sure you maintain that size. So like if the path M2 changes on you and you just don't notice it, it's possible that it goes Then like down. your quick connection is going to just like bubble Right, and then, then you'll send point. the packets and they'll just get lost and you'll realize that you're losing packets and yeah. things go So south. I think maybe the assumption in quick is that that's all okay. But if we're tunneling other things over quick, then maybe that's a bit surprising that suddenly everything just disappears. Um, I'm sure you work out what to say. Yeah, yeah, and just to, to add, a, I think you're right, but at the same time, that's also true of Ethernet. And like, <laughs> if, if that happens at some point, you know, like. I, th I think it may be worth adding a sentence. So if we can take a note in the PR, just to say like, not even necessarily normative text, but just like note that if your quick connection itself, and like if that link loses its MTU, uh, stuff can go wrong and you probably want to just kill that stream if that happens. Ben. Is ben so, okay. Yeah. Ben Schwartz. So, so, okay, you must do PMTUD over the tunnel. And if PMTUD says less than 1280 or whatever. Then you what, can't do V6. What, what, that, what do you, yeah. Okay, so that's. And the, that's actually, I think, Miriam's question. Is okay. What do you do? Right. Uh, Mary. I mean, is that, it, I haven't. See maybe the very latest text is it is it very clear like go away. Well, so the, the, so the, that is one of I think that's issue sixty two and I think Mary mentioned that that may not be clear enough in this latest PR so we may want to update that. 
I didn't, so, I didn't, yeah, it could have been. I didn't see it at all in the PR. I think we, we omitted, like we discussed it and it's not in the text. Yeah. The issue says we should say that you must close the stream and we were not clear when that was added. The, I mean, maybe I need to pull it up, but I'm 99% sure that in the PR it says if you detect that it's not sufficient, you, you must abort the stream. Not in this PR. It, I, don't, I didn't see it when I looked just now. Okay, maybe I'm just that sentence. Maybe that I'm just crazy. So, um, but, but okay, but let's just let's just add it then. I think everyone's okay with adding it. No, I want to say um, so the, the whole text says like because we're setting, sending everything about datagrams, that's the only option. But like the other option is to send it over streams. Uh, I, I I I think we when we talked before we don't necessarily want to go in that direction. Like so, you could have like some way to negotiate like i would like these to fail over to become reliable but i don't think that's the base behavior yeah that's fine i just don't think we, i want a must there or like it, the must should be bound to like using datagrams or whatever i don't know like if you if you really want to use if you want to do this right if you want to detect this and then fail over to streams you should be able to do it i see so it's like you must abort the stream unless you have some other mechanism <laughs> So that is this, this sounds like a must, but we know you won't. Uh, like, in, like re the reality is that 98% of flows are going to tolerate this just fine. And therefore, as a, as a client implementer, I think it would be very hard to convince yourself, like, yeah, I'm just going to shut everything down and brick the user's device because, like, you know, I'm not technically in compliance with IPv6 anymore. Uh, as oh. opposed to like, hmm. well, you know what? I know I'm I know I'm not in compliance anymore, but those packets probably won't get out of the network if there's runt packets. Well, I mean, so the MTU or, falls oh, a right. little no, bit too small. You're right. No, that's fine. Yeah, the yeah, MTU guess, falls yeah. a little bit below 1280. Most things are still gonna survive because most and, because and most fine. of the applications on top of you won't be double checking so, that they have enough room. Most because most most applications mm -hmm. aren't running all the way up to the MTU limit. The ones that are are usually smart enough to have a little bit of of PMTUD of their own in them yeah. and can tolerate it and back okay. off. Uh, and well, well, if you're using V4, that's fine. You don't need to tear this up. V4 technically has the same problem if you're, you know, at five at five seventy six yeah. or something. But my my point is, uh, to me, the thing that makes the most sense to to just try to be as as like <sighs> limited as possible here is to say, like, but you should do PMTUD over the tunnel. Uh, to find out the MTU, if the MTU falls below 1280, you are no longer a compliant IPv6 implementation, and and what you do with that information is is up to you. And we could make it a non-normative statement of essentially saying like, if you detect that you are not able to provide valid IPv6 over this, you can abort the stream, and just say like you can, and if you have something else you want to do, like be out of compliance or tunnel them over reliable datagrams, knock yourself out. I'm fine with any of those because at the end of the day, we're not going to implement any of these. We're going to pad the quick initial packets exactly. and that's going to be enough. <laughs> All um, right. So, so it sounds like, are we okay then just for like the minutes of the issue saying like, make this option a should do PMTUD and just say you can close the stream when you hit an issue. Uh, so as, as the default suggestion. I'm okay with that. Since Magna, since you filed the issue, what are your thoughts? Well, Miriam filed one of them too. You're okay with it? I'm, yeah. Uh, about to find out. Yeah, I'm going to um, I guess not to see that we have one, if we don't have any loopholes in this, so to say. And, and if you think it should, without having that should very hard, specific what it means, uh, you would end up in another problem. So, um, but yeah, if you're actually adding that saying, okay. And the problem really is the HTTP intermediaries here, because even if you're padding and you're, and you're uncertain if you have an HTTP intermediary, you would run into this problem. So that's why the must is supposed to be there to, to cover that situation. But like, I mean, so to follow the rule that if you ever say should, you need to give her kind of the explanation of why would it not be. So like, we could even just be very explicit, like you should do this. Otherwise, you could end up in a situation where you're not a compliant IPv6 tunnel. Okay. 
David, what's your proposal? I have a proposal that I think everyone might be okay with, which is, you know, our, 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 what we do here, never something that everyone loves, um, is to say, um, if you detect that the path MTU goes below the limit, and you, like, sorry, let me rephrase. If you are sending your IP packets over datagram, and the path you detect that the path MTU is no longer sufficient, you must close the stream because you're in violation of the RFC. Like, you can send them another way, like streams. That allows that. You could also not detect it. You could also not detect it. <laughs> and, uh, and I, like, at the end of the day, we're just made, we're 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 doing lip service to the IPv6 RFC. We're doing it right, and in practice, it'll be fine, and it won't be a pain to implement for everyone. I think this is a good little ground. All right. Connect IP, doing right by IPv6. <laughs> oh wow, I'm gonna, I'll bring that to, I'll bring, bring that to Eric Vinky. Um, okay, does, is everyone okay with that? Yeah, write it up. Sold. Okay, thank you for everyone's input so far. Next one. All right, this one I think should be easier. Um, Previously, we mentioned you can do ICMP uh, when you have errors, like you know, let's say you negotiated a full tunnel with the other side, and then you told them, here's your source address with an address assigned. And you say, here are the routes you can send to with a route advertisement. And then the other side just starts sending garbage that's not in that, that violates your ACLs and they're being bad. Um, that may be intermixed with good traffic. You don't need to tear down your entire connection or your entire stream to them. How do you let them know they were sending bad things? And you could invent a bunch of capsules, but we think that just sending ICMP errors back is the right thing to do because that's they have the, the correct error codes and that's the right thing for this layer. Um, it was kind of nonspecific. So the changes we did is we gave specific examples of like, hey, Probably if you're trying to send to something you don't have a route for, you should send destination unreachable with the error code of like, you can't reach that thing. I forget which, it's like number five. Um, and same thing for if you send a bad source. Um, and if you send a packet that's too large or then you get the correct error for that. So just do the obvious thing for those. Um, and then the only other part of this that's I think a bit more interesting is it essentially says that you should, if you are giving routes, route advertisements to the peer, which not everyone does, but like a, in a peer to peer VPN case, both sides give it to each other. In the client to proxy case, just the proxy gives it to the client. That should include in the protocols that are listed as allowed ICMP. But then essentially if you are not giving routes to your other side, like the client does not give routes to the server, um, it essentially says that it is always assuming that you essentially always need to be prepared to receive ICMP packets. So even if you are just creating a IP tunnel for ESP, you need to handle ICMP over this thing because that's how you get your errors. Any issues with that? Martin Duke as issues with that. <laughs> just, just to clarify this, this is that the, this is that the proxy, uh, by the way, Martin did Google, no hats. Um, uh, so to clarify the, the, the proxy ought to forward these ICMP messages in the tunnel and the client must be able to handle that, whether or not they do anything with it. It's not necessarily, I guess we don't say anything about whether or not you need to forward them if you receive them from the outside. It's more like you can generate them on the proxy ah. to tell, like, the client sends you as the proxy something that they're not allowed to send to you. And, like, you just, you will, you can generate ICMP back to them of, like, stop. You did the wrong thing. Okay. Fair enough. Um, but the client must be able to handle that. Like, prepared yeah. to receive is a weird, like, like, like you shouldn't crash. Well, you should yeah, right. crash, like, 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 I mean, okay. I, like you shouldn't have done this anyway. Um, like probably what you're going to do is just log an error. Cause like if this proxy server told you you're only allowed to send to this other IP address and you sent to a different one, like you, you have problems. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't know what it means. Like must handle it. It's like, it's just like 
you will receive this. I don't know. Okay. Well, all right. So, I mean, like, this is kind of a wordsmithing thing, but yes. like, if without further negotiation, the server might generate these things, then the client has to be like prepared to receive them. Like, it's not an error if I get an ICM. Exactly. Packet. Right. Okay. It's, 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 it's almost like saying, like, you know, if we've defined all the basic quick frames, I don't think we have like a, a client must support receiving this quick frame and not crash when they see this number. It's like, yeah, it's just, okay. it's just the protocol. All right, but, all right. Okay. So the point is these might arrive and you'd be prepared for it. That's cool. Thanks. Cool. Alex. Uh, hi, Alex Chernohovsky, Google. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that the text that Tommy has on the slides here about the language is not with the language, which is in the PR, I don't think. So I think the not comment around right. wordsmithing is more about the slide. Please look at the PR if you think the sure. text needs more wordsmithing. Yes. The, 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 these are conversation topics, not the uh, literal text. Ben, ben Schwartz, uh, I just wanted to uh, try to understand uh, whether this really covers all the uses of ICMP. Like, does this mean that I can, uh, you know, run traceroute through a tunnel whose IP protocol says TCP? Um, you know, uh, I, I think like you, you, yes, but that doesn't guarantee that it's going to forward it. And like, like, I don't think it says anything about whether or not you will discover a full well, lots of lots of ICMP black holes on the uh, right, on the internet. Right. We can, it, it, we can it could be an ICMP black hole. Like, we we could yeah. say like you should not black hole ICMP. That that might be nice. But uh, but the the important thing is like I can functionally I can send ICMP. Um, yes. Uh, including and I can receive ICMP replies from from source IPs that aren't the target, right? Because a trace route. In traceroute, the the source IPs are not point. are not the target IP. Uh, like, is that also something that that, that yeah, works? Yeah, that's a good point. In this um, framework, or does I, our format compression lose the source IP? Well, there's no compression here. Okay. Um, you know, you, you would absolutely get it. Um, I would like to hear other pe other authors' opinions on this because I don't care. I can either say, like, either you say you only allow it by default from your peer. Otherwise, you just say you just allow all ICMP and just do with it what you will. I'm noticing Nuria's ghost is in the queue. I find that funny. Uh, so to answer Ben's question, I, I agree. I think we should just say, just add a note that the source address can come from somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of black holing, we already say that like connect IP endpoints operate as routers. So if someone wants to knock themselves out and read the hundreds of pages of RCs that have been written on what a router is supposed to do, you should, but one of them is don't black hole ICMP. So I don't think we need to say anything. I mean, I think practically it's fairly likely that a lot of clients will just black hole ICMP if the proxy tries to randomly trace route through them. <laughs> but True, yeah. That's probably okay. Oh, 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 that's the other point I wanted to add is you don't need ICMP to do trace route. You can, uh, mm -hmm. like, if you're sending TCP, you can send TCP packets sure. with a small hub count, and then the ICMP is the response, not the sent packet. That's true. That's true. Mia Kulevin, I think I slightly, slightly disagree. So, this is only saying, like, even if you didn't ask for ICMP, you might get it. Yes. Um, so if you want to actually use ICMP and you want to send ICMP messages, you should, you, should, you should ask for it. You should tell your proxy to do it. I mean, I agree that like, if if my like if my intent is I want to open a thing so I can ping this random server, and that's all I want to do, just saying I want to open up ICMP makes sense. If what I'm let's say what I'm doing is like I'm trying to open up SCTP to this particular server. I sh I think if I have an error reaching that that comes back as ICMP, just receiving the ICMP all the way through is nice. I shouldn't have to explicitly yeah. say, please also open up ICMP for me. Yes. Um, and so that's okay here. So then, yeah. I guess yeah. the only other case is like if I want to send random pings and ICMP-based trace routes and also use SCTP, why wouldn't I just open up a request for each of those or like have my tunnel be big enough to do both? That's kind of just like good practice with the proxy. So, so my response, yeah, I mean, they, from the discussion we had, why I brought this up is that I was really to ensure that you first, the endpoint can send ICMP back to the client if it sends something bad. Yes. 
and two, also get the feedback from beyond the proxy when it, if it, for example, reach port unreachable or something like that, the packet to be, they should be returned back if the, uh, the, the, the proxy can actually map it back to this mm -hmm. request, so. Violent agreement. That's the same, right? It, like, the, yeah, if the Chris. proxy, if the proxy receives an ICMP, you don't know if it's the one that you sent. If you send the same to the client, or if you generate a new one. I mean, this is the same use case. No, no but there are cases like uh, because we're saying that the ICMP is used as an error message for certain cases for just a request. It might be the proxy that generates only for the tunnel. It doesn't comes from the lower the interface beyond on the external yeah. side of the, yeah. So but if it comes from the outside, you just don't know. It's the ICMP you get from the proxy is the same. No, no, no. Uh, well, I mean, the, the, the addresses on the ICMP could be different. Like you could tell like, oh, this came from my source address of the PR I was trying to send to, or it came from my proxy's IP address. OK, but like, yeah, you, you cannot stop it. You cannot receive yeah, you, right, you can't stop it. You can receive it from either place, and that's OK. Um, so uh, hi, Alex, again. Uh, this is actually an area which I tried to push back on two IETFs ago when we started adding IP Proto originally because of the complexities around this. Mm -hmm. I think that the only way we can resolve this is that you can't actually allow sharing the same IP address with different IP Protos if you want to support these sort of hard to distinguish ICMP messages and align them up with the different tenants on the same IP. So like, I think yes. one thing which is very clear is that having the proxy and the client be able to have over their direct point to point link exchange ICMP about that is very easy to do. But the moment you start saying, oh, I have an IP proto restriction that says I can only do DCB over the tunnel and also want to get ICMP messages from the far end, we need to make sure that we are able to restrict that down to the messages which are identifiable for the yes. like three tuple there. I, I so think we, that is a good point because right, these error cases are such that the proxy can recognize, oh, that ICMP was in response to this packet that I sent and that came from this tunnel. Right. And essentially, it's like, I think the proxy should have the choice to only forward those, or if it thinks you have full control over this IP address, forward you all ICMP. Right. So I think the, so I think the minimum behavior that we need to guarantee is you will always get ICMP error reporting on the point to point link, yes. regardless of what IP proto that you, you have requested. If you want to guarantee that you also get all ICMP messages for this IP, you must also uh, request ICMP for this IP proto. However, uh, advanced proxy may be aware of the three tuples and five tuples and uh, forward you additional yeah. ICMP information. Right. If, if you want to guarantee you have a full tunnel, ask for a full tunnel. Um, you may also get some other ICMP if the proxy is smart. I think we can clarify that a little bit in the text, but this is useful. Thank you. Okay. Um, this one was meaty. Um, so previously, uh, I think last ITF, we were trying to fix up address assigned. So we fixed Pause this. for one second. Oh, sorry. Anthony, you're requesting slides, but I assume that means you wanted to be in the queue? Sweet. One last comment, and then we'll keep going. <laughs> One last Hi. comment. Like, Hi. Um, I'm new to this mask thing, but I know the I, uh, ESP and IPsec world. Huh? RFC 4301 as a text, what kind of ICMPs you should allow. And that's basically looking in the payload, because ICMP errors should have a payload part of the packet yeah. which you send forward. And you look at that payload, and then you decide, was it allowed by the mask? Yeah. Oh. That sounds like very good text to copy. Yeah. Not only will allow it if the forward packet was allowed, then you do the reverse lookup. And if the reverse lookup supports it, then yeah. you allow those only errors. Yeah, so that's uh, 4301? So RFC 4301 cool. is a text for it. And I can support you to that. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, I think I remember that text. Yeah, I mean, we can we can definitely add more text if that's helpful. But like, you can just decide to ignore all ICMP messages or whatever. Like, you can do whatever you want. The only point is like you have to be prepared to, to get them. Yes. Yeah. But I, I think it's good advice though, too, because this is a that's a well-behaved proxy that's acting as a very nice tunnel. All right. So back uh, to address requests. Previously, we tried to fix address assign, and I think we did a good job there. Uh, Bang just raised some good issues explaining how address request had uh, 
semantic ambiguity problems. So this really isn't too much of a problem in a VPN to VPN site to site case in which sides are assigning each other addresses, requesting addresses, assigning routes bidirectionally, and they're just like all free form tunneling. It is more of a problem if you are kind of just like client to proxy opening something out uh, because previously the address request was just like an optional thing that you send if you want a particular address and if you don't want a particular address, you don't send it. Um, you know, it was obviously, the, the proxy would never send that to the client because the client can't assign addresses. But the sensible place, if you do care about your address, is to send the capsule for address request at the beginning, right after your actual um, request. Uh, the server has no idea if you're going to send that or not. And so it will receive the request, maybe give you a 200, but like it's how long is it going to wait before it checks if you have an address request capsule or not before it gives you an address to sign? Like it was completely ambiguous. And you could come up with some you know, rule of like, oh, you just negotiate out of band whether or not you do that. But that was gross. Um, there was discussions about, oh, okay, you can add a header to say, I'm going to send this capsule, but that also is problematic. The proposal here is just to say, you always send an address request if you want an address assigned. So there are different models of Connect IP. Not everyone needs an address assigned. Like for example, like the proxy server never receives an address assigned from a client, so it doesn't send an address request. But if the client wants an address assigned, it needs to send an address request. If the client out of band already knows what IP address it has assigned to it and they don't need an address assigned, then it doesn't need to send it. So it's just kind of very parallel. Like if you want an address assigned, you better send an address request. Um, this also opened up kind of a nice property that the address request, previously you would only send if you had a specific prefix you wanted to be in or a specific address you wanted. But if you don't care, you send all zeros um, for your actual addresses. Um, that's nice because now you can say explicitly, like, I want a v4 address assigned to me, or I want a v4 and a v6, or I just want a v6. Um, and you can also specify within that the prefix. Um, so you can even have just all zeros, but like you say, I want a slash 64, or I want a slash 128. You can, you can give the semantics of what you're expecting to get back. And then of course the proxy can assign you something more specific within that, or it, it can just use that as input as a hint. Um, so I think that works pretty nicely. Uh, one other tweak here, just to make sure that if you're asking for v4 and v6, or if you're being assigned v4 and v6, you had it all at the same time, was that just like we did for the route advertisement capsule where we just had the capsule be a, a array of repeating route structures that have the different protocol uh, families, the address request and address assigned capsules can contain multiple addresses. So you know, the first one just says, oh, this is a v6 address and then it has the v6 address. So then it's followed by a v4 address and that's all in one capsule. Uh, any issues with this? This was the hardest for us to actually discuss. So hopefully we'll have consensus on it. <laughs> David Skenazi. So no, I don't have any issue with this. I just wanted to, uh, this was a hard one for us to reason about and it's a really hard one to explain. So if, if you're wondering what the hell Tommy's talking about, don't worry, that's normal. But at least all of the editors thought about it and thought that was a nice solution that was really sim both simple and just like avoided a lot of the caveats that we were running into. So just wanted to say like, we're, we're on the same page. I think this is a good way forward. Yeah. I think it's one of the things that like looks kind of like, oh, that's kind of simple and straightforward, but yeah. that's it after the fact. Yeah, maybe a diagram would have helped, but we'll yeah. we'll see what MT thinks. He's taking the long way around. I don't know if that's something I should be worried about. <laughs> so, so have you changed the spelling at all? Changed the what? I'm I'm looking at the spec. I'm looking at the the discussion here. So this is a PR. It's not merged in yet. 
you said issue 66. Oh, 70. All right, I'm looking at it now. The PR does change the wire format. Yeah, the wire format just, it, well, it, it changes the capsule number and then it just allows it to be repeatable. The interior of the capsule is now repeatable as opposed to being a one singleton. So it's repeatable and you have to include the address family as well? You on, already on have H, the address family. So it's address family, uh, prefix length. So there's capsule type, value. capsule length, then address family, address prefix. Address family, address prefix. Address family, address prefix. Like, okay, I think I, I can probably get behind that. It's, it was like, because I already had the parser for the other one, it was pretty easy to just put a while loop around it, and it worked. <laughs> My name is uh, one thing I realized here is that in this case, a part of fulfillment must be okay. Maybe we need to be explicit about that. Because if you're asking for both a v4 and v6 address, and the proxy can only give you either of them, yes, you need to be fine with that. So. Yeah, that, that's a good, we could add a sentence for that of just saying like, remember, just because you ask for something does not mean you get it. And that is true for both Connect IP and life. But <laughs> <laughs> right, well, this is, this is, if you want something, ask for it, but you may not get it. it, it this is really just reflective of life. All right. Okay, no, Miria. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I wasn't at the editor meeting, unfortunately, but I read the PR and I thought it very good, but I just want to confirm something. So this, this in, assume uh, a little bit of like pre-configuration knowledge about if you, if you are supposed to request an address or not or whatever. I, I think, so by default, you request an address if you want to be able to set, to send. Yeah. Um, it, it leaves it open such that if you had some extremely specialized deployment where you were like completely out of band, you, you just know you always have this. It's a static IP. I, I don't know what it is. Like, or potentially even if you have an extension in the future where you say, I don't actually put in source IPs. I let the proxy yes. write my source IP for me. I know I don't need to actually write anything here. I don't need to do it. So yeah. it gives us that wiggle room, but, so, but if you're means... implementing the base draft, you will almost certainly always send an address request. Yeah. But that also means like if you want to do something else and you want to have this pre-configuration in there, then it's kind of for all requests, like, like because you cannot provide it dynamically. So like you have to just like statically configure it. Well, uh, uh, so I mean, just to be pedantic here, while it, if you expect to get an address assigned, you should send an address request. That does not mean that you cannot get an unsolicited, unsolicited address assigned. Nothing prevents any side from sending that. I understand that it works. I'm just saying it's like it gives you less flexibility or makes your configuration a little bit harder. I'm just trying to understand. Well, let me like how it, how yeah. So the, the idea there is say, think of it kind of like DHCP. If you don't ask the DHCP for an address, you're not going to get one. And you're probably not going to get, you might not necessarily get the one you ask for if someone else has taken it. Uh, so the idea is if you're expecting it to assign you an address, you send that. But let's say you're a VPN and in your VPN config file, you put a static IP address, you, right. you're not going to send DHCP over the VPN. So that, that's what it's there for. Right. <coughs> it it kind of replicates traditional IP networking. Oh, right. or, or if you've agreed with your VPN that you just put all zeros for your source address and it rewrites your packets for you, that's also fine. Okay, that's more insane, but... <laughs> good. I mean... As some fancy compression thing, you're just like, I just don't care what my address is. Give me one, whatever. Yeah, all I was asking is like, basically, if you have this configuration, then basically you have to take it like for all your requests. Like, it's not like you can do it on a request basis. Yeah. Cool. Ben is next. Uh, yeah, so, so first of all, does this add a round trip to the time before I can send my first packet? Uh, no, but it's a good question. So, um, this goes in the same flight as your request. So like, I mean, it's just like the capsule is back to back with your request. You don't wait okay, to receive so how, what okay. source IP do I, do I use? So connect IP already has an issue with knowing what source IP to send from mm -hmm. in general. Yeah. Um, so actually in, in some ways this makes it better. So if I'm thinking of like full tunnel VPN or whatever, I don't know what you do, but like, 
if I'm requesting a specific address, because let's say I knew a specific address I had received on another stream previously, I could you know, optimistically say, please give me that same address. I will send my initial packets from it. You may drop them. You may give me a different address. And so like, it can fail over to something longer. But this does not make anything worse, certainly, with regards to when you can start sending packets. Uh, OK. I think uh, I, would, I would just like, like it to be possible to just send packets on the, the first flight, basically, if you're willing to tolerate that. But I agree. Uh, okay. You can, like, but they may be dropped if you choose a bad source address, or you, or we, we can also do a thing where the proxy can okay. rewrite your source address for you if it doesn't like it. And Regardless like, of that, I, I looked at the, the issue and I noted that there was a this question of um, the prefix length. So it seems like maybe this isn't entirely settled, but what is the um, what is the rule for the prefix length on the all zeros? Um, so, so the, the capsules themselves, yeah. which you send that are address requests, like yeah. the address assigned, yeah. are of a structure that is repeated struct with protocol address prefix length. Right. And so you specify in your request the prefix length. So can I set if it's it seems like all zeros means doesn't have a preference. You see, it, it means here. that I don't have a preference for the specific address I'm going to receive, but I can express a preference for the prefix length I would like right. to receive. I think that is not compatible with the uh, IPv6 specification. Maybe not with IPv4 either. Uh, How? The IPv6 what? reserves all zeros slash 128. That is the only reserved address for this purpose in IPv6. This, so this, this is the, not expressing an address. So think of it like, so in IPsec, it's like a traffic selector. This is a, this is a way of expressing a desired range. Right. It but is not, like, I'm not saying I own this address. Like, right, but 000 slash 64 is a valid, sub, well, uh, valid subnet. Well, uh, or at least. If you're allowed to assign that, the other side may assign it to you. <laughs> oh, right, but now there's an ambiguity. Am I actually asking for it, or am I asking? Am I? Am I is zeros here a dummy address, and I'm not asking for it for real, or? So, so sorry to jump in on the wire format here. You send 128 bits here. Right. So sending all zero is a dummy. Yes, that is a special thing, and that happens to be resolved. Reserve. Reserve. Okay. And hopefully that resolves things. Uh, so, so okay. what, what you're saying is that if I like, if I if I want to request the okay zero I, zero slash sixty four, I okay. would send sixty four bits of zero and then sixty four bits of one. Okay. And I, it's I, I, I think Stop that me. I can I can retract this. We can and say this is safe because there is at least one reserved IP address in any range yes. whose whose IP identifier is all zeros, and therefore any any such yes. subnet is non-allocatable. And so essentially saying okay. that the, the, this wild card must be all zeros all the way through to the end. Fine. All right. Uh, Jonathan. Jonathan Lennox. I was um, slightly, my eyebrows raised slightly that when you said you could send a unsolicited address assigned even if you didn't get an address request, because I wondered what happens if a client sends address assigned unsolicited to a proxy? It would ignore it. I mean, or, is there a way to really say, you, can close I mean, the stream. I mean, it, it would, I mean, I guess, should there be a way of saying if you get an address assigned when you're not able to be have your address assigned, you should, does it explicitly say that, close the stream, or does it need to say that? Or? I don't, I don't think so. Um, so we've talked about error handling in general. Um, I, I think it's certainly plausible that some future extension that wants more complex semantics for different types of assignments could add some oh i didn't i rejected this capsule i rejected that but i think if you do something like try to assign your server a address it just decides if it either ignores it or says you're a misbehaving client and closes on you i don't know martin what do you think yeah i, I think many things um but probably not about that. I was thinking about another question that I okay. had. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, okay, sure. Go, Go for it. Yeah. So just because you send an address assigned, it doesn't mean that you get the address, address assigned. So if you receive an address assigned, you just should send a request. No, sorry, no. the other way around. If <laughs> you get a request, 
doesn't mean that you actually get that IP address, right? So if you, mm -hmm. if you get a request, you should just send and assign with the IP address that you assigned. Yes, and, and vice versa. Like if, if the client sends a proxy, like I've assigned you this address, what you were telling the proxy is, hey, I'm a client and I will accept if you send packets to me from that address. Like the proxy is like, okay, I don't really care. I'm not gonna send anything to you anyway from that address, but thanks for letting me know. <laughs> It's like you can give out your phone number to whoever you want, <laughs> but that doesn't mean they'll call you. <laughs> so another way of thinking that it, of that is the client says, I, "Here's an address assigned. Can you can you please advertise this over BGP and, and for me and, <laughs> and and establish a route to it?" And I think the answer is just no. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the question I got up to ask was, um, yeah. "Will you always receive and assign?" in response to a request. Oh, that's a good one. Can you, um, can you expect to see some sort of indication that, that when you ask for something, the, the, the server has acknowledged that? Because there's, this particular arrangement has this weird property whereby in a lot of cases, the server is just gonna go, here, have a bunch of addresses as soon as the connection is established. Yes. And um, it doesn't really depend on seeing a, a request. In that in that case, right. This is a bug. Well, so let the way I'm I'm thinking about it currently is that you know I think we're pretty clear that you are not allowed to send. Well, sorry, you are not guaranteed that packets you send will be accepted until, until you have received assigned. both an assign and a route advertisement. And so, on the client, you can wait around for those. And essentially, like, I don't know if I don't get it immediately, if it's because you're taking a while to actually figure out what address I have, I'll have to have some time out there. I know it's a reliable stream, so I know you received the thing. So we can say like, the server must eventually reply once it can actually assign it, otherwise it should close the stream to be nice. So I, I think this is a bug of something that we accidentally glazed over when we were talking about this. Okay. I think when we made it such that every, ad I think in the previous version of a draft, address request always got an address assigned response, but now that we've made it repeated and fallible, I think we need to define that if you get a request that cannot be satisfied because we want to give you no addresses back whatsoever, we still need to indicate okay, that's fine. that you that's fine. with an empty address yes. response or something, which yes. I think solves Martin's problem. Yes, so you, it should be paired with a response. Um, the response could be, like if I, if I send multiple requests, you could just send, no, you still have the addresses you had before, get over it. Um, but you could also just, wait and like you probably do have to handle a timeout where this side just isn't responding to you so i i think there's that that helps i don't think it completely addresses the 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 suite of problems that are now possible so um in the case that you ask for say you ask for one address or two addresses and the server yeah. says no you can't have either of them i think it's reasonable to to have either an error message coming back or even just address assign empty yeah which, yes, which, which That's is perfectly right. reasonable. Um, but it is very, very difficult to distinguish between a positive address assignment for, for something that you requested, um, particularly in the zero, zero case where you, you really don't care what you get, and a spontaneous advertisement of uh, addresses that, that are coming through. Does it matter? Uh, and, and, and Jonathan behind me is saying request IDs. Um, Ooh. so, um, so I mean, I, from, from so, the client perspective, do I, am I still waiting is, is still a question that I cannot resolve except for the empty case, because the empty case will never happen except in response to that, that's a request. True. But so I mean, what, one property of these, I want to make sure we're clear on is that an address assigned capsule is, and maybe we should be clear about this, like inclusive of all of the addresses you are assigned now. Like, so it's it, cumulative? So if we have it be cumulative, which I think we probably need to clarify, then it is unambiguous that when you receive it, this is this is all of the addresses you have. And so it doesn't really matter at that point, like if there is a race, like maybe I'll end up getting two of them that are duplicates if you want to generate an extra one in response to me, but they are fully describing. And at that point, if the client has requested an arbitrary addre address, you could it say, care. no, it I receives, gave you this other one instead. So, so say I request one address and, yes. and it's an arbitrary one. I don't care which one it is. I get an address back. That's the How do I distinguish between that being a spontaneous advertisement on the part of the server and a response to my request? 
I would argue that you wouldn't care and you may like you may get another response that's just a duplicate of that capsule of like by the way you got this and you'd be like oh I guess that first one was spontaneous but I've already moved on Okay, I think I can probably see how that would work out. Yeah, yeah. I, I, we should clarify that. None case. of that was written down. I couldn't answer. Yes, that question it was. It was not written down. Okay. It was not written down before. Thank you. My name is um, I want to try to respond to Ben. Uh, ask about the CRRTT cases initially. I don't think they work currently. I don't think you can do. I think we need some type of extension saying that, hey, I'm going to send you a packet with a source address. Please rewrite. I think that actually is, ends up being something you need to signal explicit, because otherwise you end up in or use the zero zero or something. You need to we need to specify something for. We can't leave it as it now. So I well I I believe that you, you could absolutely specify an extension that or or a behavior in here if we want to add it in that says if I send from zero zero I assume it's going to be the default thing you assign me. But honestly I don't even know if it's v four v six. I think it's really messy. Yeah. But so I think the one thing you can do now is if you know about an address, you could request the address. Yes. You, you know you have a target because that's a specific address you asked to connect to. You could try sending on it. Yeah. There's a chance that they will assign you no address or a different address. And then that was a case where the, you'll have to retransmit your packet or like, you know, whatever yeah, you do normally. Yeah. But I, that, that one gets through. Yeah. I understand that case. Okay. But so that's, that is the your, one case where you get zero RTT. Yes, yeah, so. well, yeah. But I think when you responded to them before, it sounded much, much wider that basically anything would work, and I think that's wrong. You need to have some really high probability that you know what the address is going to be to make this work. Or we need to have something, either specified behavior or an extension. Yeah, I mean, well, it's like, I think when yeah. I was talking about the more open things, like, if you have the site to site VPN case where yeah, yeah, sure, sure. they, but they, I, they have I'm their own app address that they assign to themselves, then like it's yeah. probably but in, in normal it's VPN case, when you are saying, hey, give me an address, you have to wait for a response before you start sending packets. Which is the case with all yeah. remote access VPNs today, yes. anyway. But you know, if this is a large enough tunnel that this is like, this is, I'm going to be able to send my entire device's IP traffic over this, that one RTT is. I think okay, and if I'm doing very specific flows, I probably have a previous address I can request. So, yeah, Ben Schwartz, I, I don't, I still don't think it actually works. Uh, what? Like the, so so imagine that I, I I'm trying to optimistically send uh, before I have the address assigned. Yep. So I set my source address to all zeros. I'm not saying that case. And then I get that. So that that's that the, needs an extension to do something like that. So okay, so the. Then yeah, so right now then there's there's no way to just like connect and and immediately send an IP packet in the way that there is in Connect UDP. No, if I have a previous address, so let's say I have one quick tunnel to my Connect IP server, and I've previously opened other streams. I've already opened an IC uh, an SCTP stream to that host, and I've opened an SCTP stream to this other host. Well, I can just say give me another SCTP stream from the same address. I can try so, sending on it. I, I mean, I guess you can try. But yes. there's no reason to expect that the client would be assigned consistent IP addresses across those different tunnels. But you are requesting it. And so, so for example, like even the way we use Connect, Connect UDP today with our mass servers, like there are lots of reasons on the web for within one tunnel to give a consistent IP address because lots of websites, for example, will freak out if you start changing IP addresses on every single connection within different resources. Um, so I think it is reasonable, and this may be kind of a deployment specific, like the, the, the sides need to learn what is consistent in behavior, but I think it's very reasonable to, for a proxy to be able to assign you a consistent IP address as long as it has it available. Uh, okay, I mean, it, we're, we're way outside the HTTP resource model now, right? Where like this- Sorry, I, I mean, I, I meant more different hosts. So like, like, for example, like there are pages where like I, load the main page and then they have their login resource, which is a different host name. And if it comes from a different IP address, they I, fail it immediately. I understand. I just mean like every, yeah. every targeted connect IP tunnel is a separate HTTP resource. In principle, they're like, there's no particular reason why they should have this like state correlation across them where they somehow sure, assign which is why it's a request IP address. Like we can't guarantee it, but optimistically. Okay. Something that you I mean, do. I think, I think really you're, you're right that it, it's not, it's probably just uh, not that important. I don't personally really know why the 
why you would want a target targeted connect IP tunnel uh, anyway. But uh, so I think we should just be very clear that that basically uh, zero RTT is not really supported. I, I don't think that's the way I would summarize it. It's just like it, it is just kind of the wild west, and you can request something and you can be optimistic about it. But so the the wild west is what I'm trying to avoid because the 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 weird thing you end up with is like I sent like I picked a random IP address for the source address. And I didn't guess right. I didn't guess what I got well, back in the address. Picking a random assigned. one is a very good way to probably fail to get. So, like, right this is my so. question: Are source addresses allowed to be rewritten, or are is there a rule like if I if the address assigned comes back and the source IP I set wasn't on the list, was my packet delivered? Was it rewritten or was it dropped? I don't have any explicit indications. Well. If you send something, you should get an ICMP error if it doesn't like what you did. OK, so that's that's great. That's I would like, if, we have, if we have a hard rule yes. that says, like, yeah. either your packet is if delivered or you, you get will, an... Yeah, that's what the other text was about to say. You should get an ICMP error in that case. OK. That, then that, it's clear. Then it's you clear. Know. Yeah. yeah. So I have not cut the queue, because I think it's important that we close on this to make some progress. But please do try to keep things I brief. I think this is the last slide. It's the last big one. Um, so I, I wanted to reply to Ben and actually try to clarify some of the things which I think there's some confusion here. So there's a couple of different modes of using connect IP. I think broadly speaking, the dynamically assigned open VPN case, zero RTT is almost never going to work because you're going to be assigning these IP addresses to a virtual network device on the host OS anyway. So I personally consider their zero RTT to not be a priority or a goal. So I think the place where the zero RTT optimistic packet sending thing there makes more sense when you're doing one of the targeted tunnels, either yes. because it's a UDP user space thing or something like that. And there, particularly if the client already has a long established uh, H3 connection, which already has multiple such targeted connect IP tunnels, with high probability, it's going to be load balanced to the same process module on your meter areas, in which case it already has in memory the address assignments for that client. And it is very, very, very likely in yes. fact, almost certain for most reasonable implementations, it's going to reuse the same IP address for that particular client. It's not guaranteed. It's not so guaranteed. You have to get an error back um, if in case it doesn't work. Uh, so if you want to, use, I mean, if you believe this, then it should be a should. If you what? I, I think I think it already is a should. Like if that we already have in the text here, but if a client asks for an IP, we should give it back. But like, we, we might not, right? Like there's no guarantee because it yeah. might already be it given somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing I wanted to mention here is that you never have a guarantee of packet delivery here if it went over a datagram. So like even to your earlier comment of like, I'd like to get back an ICMP error, if it was lost somewhere on path, you're not going to get it. So all of those things around the other commentary around like, is it going to be rewritten to with an extension? If we have that in the future, like you could imagine having an extension of like, please go be right to my target IP, where I might send you garbage source bits. And if that gets sent before the packet is processed, then yes, you should expect that that would work. But that's not currently defined in the base. Exactly, exactly. Cool. Oh, we do have one more. I think this is already covered. Yeah. Oh, sorry, my plan. Mia Kulevin again. I um, have a question regarding this idea we had about sending an empty address assign if you don't want to give the client an assign an address or yeah. Why would you, wanna, you do that? I, I mean, mean yeah, why, why don't you if you don't real, want to give the client an address, then just close the connection, right? Yeah, more realistically, you just close the stream. I think that's a better option. That's a good point. Thank you. So actually, this is relevant to what I wanted to ask. I think. Part of the earlier discussion, we changed something that's not currently in the PR, but I think is a good change, which is to say that now address assign is cumulative. Yes. And no, I know, then I'm going to write it. Uh, and that solves some of these problems. So let's say, you know, if you, I'm only assigning you one instead of two, like you can see that. Uh, so that's nice. I just want. Yes. Uh, I guess so. Yeah. Yes, this, sol I, this solves unassigned, which was oh, that's before. great, yeah, yeah, cool, um, bingo, yeah, all right, that's even better. So that, all right, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Jonathan was saying that that allows you to remove addresses, and I'll add a sentence that says that actually, because yeah. uh, why not? Right, and, and like I think it should still be permissible to assign only zero addresses because potentially in a site-to-site -site VPN case there may be a moment when all connectivity is lost, and then they bring it back online, and you don't necessarily need to tear down your quick streams. Yeah, like I mean, I don't think it should be forbidden to do that. Yeah, I don't think we need to say anything. Let's yeah. say, yeah. Uh, cool. Okay, no, I just wanted to make sure because that was kind of a non-trivial change cool. to the PR that we had the editors had agreed to. I just want to make sure that 
no one objects to that, but it does seem to solve quite a few things nicely. And on top of that, it becomes fully consistent with route advertisement, which is just next. Exactly. Yep. Um, so the last bit here, this is essentially already covered in our discussion we just had. Like, if you need to send the packets, you need to wait for address assign route advertisement. If you want to know when it is time to send address assign, you wait for an address request. I think it's very clear. Uh, just the one last thing I'll mention, which we believe is not in scope for this document, but if you are trying to extend Connect IP and you want to have fancy new capsules that do things to affect your routes and addresses, and those are like super important about the ordering, you need to be concerned about the ordering or have a way to batch them. But that is left as an exercise to those extensions to deal with, and it does not need to have any complexity into the base Connect IP draft. And that is the last thing I have. So unless someone has a point on that, we can move on to the rest of the agenda. So close all the issues. Woo. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Tommy. Next up, we have Ben. Do you want to share slides? Do you want me to share slides? Cool. Magic, magic slides then. Thank you all for the engagement on that. By the way, we're very close to the kind of end of the issues list for Connect IP. So this is excellent to make some good progress. Access service description first. Okay. Sweet. Uh, okay, hello. HTTP access service description objects next. So the, the backdrop here is that uh, although it's clear how we describe and convey and configure a connect UDP endpoint or a connect IP endpoint, uh, the services that we're really interested in, I think are likely to be more complicated than that. They're likely to have multiple components. So I think that it's reasonably likely that you'll have connect UDP and connect IP and DOE all offered essentially as a package, meaning tied to the same user accounts intended to be used together as a, as a service. Um, I think it's reasonably likely that you could have a, a DOE resolver that's associated with an old fashioned connect TCP proxy. Um, I think that there, there are a bunch of these different combinations of, uh, of these services that we, I think are going to want to be able to configure, convey, uh, in a in a standardized way. Next. And so the, the realization for me is that although we have, I think, all these different potential use cases, they actually are all instances of a, of a single pretty simple general problem. We need a machine that takes as an input a URL or an origin, or, you know, could be just kind of a string. Uh, and its output has one or more of these different <laughs> kinds of services that we've begun to define, both here in MASC and in OHI, and potentially anything else that is an access service, a thing that you would want to use as a component of, uh, of a larger access service that helps you get access to something else on the internet. OK, next. Uh, so the thing I'm proposing here is a really dead simple JSON format. And the easiest way to talk about it is to just look at one. So like here is a, an access service description of a, uh, of a proxy. This proxy has a DOE server, a connect UDP endpoint, a connect IP endpoint, and an OHI relay. Uh, and so like rather than saying, oh, client, you know, your user interface has like four different text entry fields, and you're supposed to go in and paste one after another all of the different, um, all of the different URI templates for all of these different services. We can say, look, we're standardizing a format, and so your, your user interface has a single input field, uh, and that is uh, maybe a URL hosting a file like this, maybe, you know, maybe even literally a file picker, and if this thing is, if this thing is actually a file that's that's being passed around. Uh, next, here's another example. This is how Oblivious Doe would be represented in this. So again, we're we're tying 
uh, a DOE service to some other kinds of access services, in this case, a, a gateway, which helps you get to that DOE endpoint. Uh, and again, it's just a, a very simple JSON format. Next. So uh, the idea for this draft is that probably access services, all these different sort of composite services that I've been talking about are generally identified by a URL. And that is the URL of an access service description. It's a URL that you send a GET request to, and it sends you back a JSON object. Um, except there are some cases where that doesn't work, where for a legacy reason or for interoperability with some other system, the only identifier we have is a, an origin or a host name. We, don't, we can't use a URL as our initial identifier. And so in that case, we use dot well-known. We say this thing lives on a dot well-known. Next. Okay, so like we can solve any problem by introducing an extra level of indirection. Um, and so this is just a level of indirection. Instead of passing connect UDP URI templates around, we pass around a file containing, well, a URL of a file containing connect UDP templates. And I think there's a, a bunch of useful stuff that this enables. Like you can, uh, if you want to do fast HTTP3 bootstrap, you need, in, well, you, you arguably need a, uh, HTTPS records. You need to be able to query HTTPS records out of the DNS, but you can't do that uh, unless you actually have a DNS server that you can use. Uh, you know, the proxy can't do, a connect UDP proxy can't do that for you. So you want a DOS server associated with your connect UDP proxy because uh, the whole point of connect UDP is to be able to use HTTP3. So you know, we can enable that. We can enable encrypted client hello through a proxy. And we can make that work even for these sort of legacy cases, uh, like the ones that we were talking about just uh, an hour ago, where our bootstrap input is a host name because we're, we're stuck in the, in the legacy world where we're, we're configuring old fashioned proxies that aren't a full URL. Uh, there's some growing interest seemingly uh, in client side DNSSEC validation uh, that's another case where the client needs direct DNS access uh, in, that a, a proxy like Connect UDP doesn't offer. I also think there's a, another sort of category of interesting ways that this can be useful, and that is helping the client to learn more about the capabilities of the access service. So, for example, you know we're about to talk about Connect UDP in listener mode. Uh, there's uh, currently no real way to discover whether a given Connect UDP instance supports listener mode. You could try it and just see what happens. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've, as we've often argued, the, the requests that you make to a, a specific resource are only valid for that one request, right? So you got an HTTP 500, but you don't know that you're always going to get a 500 talking to that. And even if, even if you sort of are willing to buy that, that uh, you can sort of probe for the capability to find out if it exists. It's, uh, it, it certainly seems like more work than just being told at startup, like, here's the capabilities of this thing. Uh, and you can evolve the capabilities of your service, right? You can start by launching a Connect UDP server, and then you can add Connect IP later, and you don't need to go and reprovision all of the clients that you've ever onboarded, right? They can just reload the configuration URL. So, uh, oh, and finally, this format is, a, is sort of a, a perfect fit for key consistency double check, which I was talking about yesterday in, in Ojai, because again, that's a case where we need to grab something like an oblivious DOE configuration uh, as a, you know, and, and, and essentially treat it as an atomic unit. And so here we have a format for representing those as atomic units. So I think this is a useful thing. It's dead simple. Uh, and I think Mask would be a good place to work on it. Before we get too deep into the queue, we have a timer on screen, which is for both of your presentations. I figured I'd let you allocate time to whichever one you wanted. OK. Hey, uh, quickly, Martin Duke, Google, uh, thank you for thinking this through. Thank you for bringing it to the working group. Um, in our infinite wisdom, we specifically excluded proxy discovery from the charter. Um, doesn't mean we can't recharter it, of course. Uh, I'd be interested in the community's views if Mask is the right venue for this or many or one of the many other working groups that this would touch. Thanks. 
All right, Tommy Polly. Um, so thanks for bringing this up. I think it's a very important conversation to have. Um, in general, I feel like I should like this direction. And like, you know, certainly in the deployment we have of mask, we have config files that say, this is a thing that is a OHTP relay and a connect proxy and a connect UDP proxy. It's like, it, it feels similar. However, like I'm not convinced about this particular shape for it. Um, I think it's combining more than we need to, particularly about like locations and keys and capabilities trying to all be in one JSON thing. It's like both too much information that's a, available to everyone in one flat way that may not be specific enough, but there's also not enough information to actually be fully useful for each of these use cases. Um, regarding the scope of working group, I think if we have a version of this that is just about mask proxying, like things that proxy end-to-end -end connections, but not OHTP and not DNS, then that can belong in mask, but I'm not convinced about it being in mask if this trying to do all of these things. I think it needs a much broader audience unless we turn mask into the all things oblivious and proxied working group, which is a, I don't know if, I don't know if that's even a transport thing anymore. Um, specifically around here, as I mentioned, like I'm, I'm concerned about keys. Like when we find like, you know, your key rotation scheme and your key management scheme may be something that uh, for your OHTP servers distributed in a different way such that the person maintaining this one big file now needs to worry about the key rotation management of a bunch of different services um, that I think ends up being quite complex. Um, I think also, you know, a lot of people aren't going to be open, running fully open proxies. Like it's one thing to say, I'm a proxy, but even today, like on the internet, like you're not going to have a proxy that you don't have authentication to that just lets you do like here, I just have connect UDP, connect OHTP, just to like the whole world. Um, I think anything around this would need a lot of like ACLs of like, I allow OHTP relays to these gateways or like a lot more specificity, which feels like they need to be separate configs for those different protocols and also be related to an authentication source. So like if I'm a client who has authentication to use this particular proxy in this manner, I have access to these services. But people who are just random people who typed in a string into their browser should not have the full capability. So these are just some of the questions it raises. And so I think we need more discussion and more work on it. And I lean towards trying to understand the in-depth use cases for the different protocols before we try to combine them all together. Uh, Jonathan Monix, yeah, I think my, my theory was sort of similarly, but narrow, more narrowly, I'm. Since this is configuring things from, I think, I think at least four different working groups and possibly five, I'm dubious whether you could do them all in one as opposed to each working group defining its own configuration. Maybe like you'd have some, uh, here's the bucket to put things in, and each working group would do its how you configure its protocol. But I'm dubious about you know defining things for OHI or uh, Deprive in this working group. David Skenazi, Google. Uh privacy of all the things enthusiast. Um, so first comment is I, I can, I can kind of see how this is useful, but I can't see anyone actually using it. <laughs> Who would use this? Uh, sure. So the, the, the easiest example for me is that this, this, the, the use case I'm pr principally targeting here is exactly the, the use case that we were just talking about with the dot well-known uh, URI temp, the, the fixed dot well-known template for, for connect IP. So like that's a the simple case where you are, you, you've, you've provisioned a bunch of devices and, and they have authorization to use an HTTP connect TCP proxy. And you want to augment that with a bunch of extra services. And so the way we've started to try to do that is by saying, okay, for each extra service, we're going to define a new path on dot well known. And that's going to be, we're going to define a URI template that lives under dot well known. And then that's going to control the structure of all the connect UDP and connect IP requests that you generate. My view is that those are not good solutions. As I mentioned earlier, they have a bunch of problems. For example, uh, 
they, they break the HTTP model of, uh, of requests because if I make a request to, if I populate that URI template in order to issue a request and I get back a 404 or something, like all that says is that that one particular URI doesn't exist. It doesn't tell me that the, whether the URI template itself is valid or whether there's some <sighs> other set of inputs that I could put in that would actually work. Uh, that also it means that I need to, to find out the capabilities of this thing. I need to send a bunch of different probes. I need to separately probe all of the different capabilities that I'm interested in. I can't just ask what are the capabilities associated with my local proxy. So that, that to me is like a, a very simple use case. Uh, and you know, moving forward, I think that our proxy configurations will be will not limit us to to host names. We'll be able to uh, configure whole URLs. And so, you know, I imagine going into my settings menu and saying, I want to set my system proxy to this URL, and that URL, you know, looks more or less like what I described. It, it has TCP, UDP, IP, OHI, and DO all in it, and any of those can change later. And uh, you know. The, there's a standard, so my, my phone knows. And for authentication, probably, uh, you know, there's some kind of like OAuth authentication flow. It's a unified authentication for all of those services. So I, I OAuth once and that, that, you know, those credentials then are used across all of these services. So I don't have to re-authenticate to all of them. That's, uh, that's my, what I'm thinking of. So that's a description of what you can do with this, yeah. not of who's going to do something with it. But anyway, I've taken up enough of the time. We're almost done. Uh, I would want to see people interested in impl implementing this before we... Sure. I mean, I, uh, I am interested in implementing this on Android, for example. I would like this to be an Android system setting so that I can drop into Android and say, like, under my VPN settings, I'd like to have a, a mask VPN setting where I can drop in essentially one of these one of these URLs and then not just get connect IP but get the whole suite of, of, of access services associated with a, a one of these complex services okay that sounds interesting um, then to your to the second question I because this touches on dough on uh, Ohi uh, on, on DNS sec, uh, I don't think that mask is necessarily the right place. I think that the, the, the layer that this operates over HTTP, you're describing all the things that you can do with HTTP, though DNSSEC sticks out on the side. But, but that, I think that's, that's, just a, job. that's just sort of a, a, an, enabled, an enabled behavior. There's no connection to DNSSEC. Okay, so, so I think maybe, but HTTP best might be the, a better fit. Jonathan said dispatch, and actually I agree with that. Okay, uh, well, it looks like I don't have time to talk about the other slides, so uh, I guess we'll, we'll talk about those some other time. Do you wanna drain the last two folks or? Totally up to uh, you. Sorry, I, sure. Um, so Mike Bishop, I'll be very brief. Um, respectfully disagreeing that this is not actually discovery of the proxy. This is discovery of the proxy's abilities once you've been configured with a proxy. Um, so I think there is a lot of value because no typical user is going to know, oh, this supports UDP, but it doesn't support IP and it does support oblivious HTTP. Who even knows what these things are outside of this building? Um, you give it a host name, it lights up interesting privacy services. I think this is useful. I think the, the question of crossing groups is easily solved by it has an IANA registry. Each group can register their own config thing, and it's just a list of supported services at this at this host name. Now, does it belong here? Does it belong in dispatch? I don't know. All of these are reasonable. Somebody needs to define it, and everybody else needs to register. Um, Alex Janowski here. Uh, actually, Mike just said what I wanted to say much better. I mostly wanted to say that one of the things that I was seeing with Connect IP is that we've continuously had a discussion that people probably want Connect IP and Connect UDP proxies to actually be hidden. So I think deciding whether or not this is a discovery system or a capability system is actually a very good point. And one of the things which I find would be very interesting is if 
whatever mechanism we choose, this JSON file, potentially one of them is, what happens if it's behind an authentic authenticated HTTP barrier, right? Like you probably don't want to go and tell someone what the capabilities of this proxy are until after you know that you're willing to serve them and you might be willing to serve different capabilities to different classes of authentication. And I think we, wherever this ends up going, we should probably think about that as well. Sorry, just really, really short. Um, God. <laughs> one thing just for when we're thinking about some of the questions going forward, um, David was asking like, who will use this? And I, I actually, you know, completely get from the client side, like, yeah, I would love to use that. I think the question we want to answer collectively is on server proxy ends, because they're the ones who have to publish this, who is deploying these sets of things and what things are they willing to lump and what are their requirements? And, <laughs> client authentication or other things like that. And those are the people who we need in this conversation who I haven't heard yet here. All right. Our last set of slides before we talk about rechartering and our little bit at the end. All right, and I have eight minutes. Yes, indeed. Cool, everyone. I'm David Skenazi. And uh, so this is a draft that came out of a conversation with Tommy where we were talking mainly about connect ip and for i don't even remember what specifically we were arguing about doesn't matter but tommy mentioned oh i'm gonna run webrtc over connect ip and i thought that sounds wrong and tommy was like well no it's super easy i inject my user space ip stack right underneath my user space udp stack underneath my stuff and boom it just works look i even have a demo and that's kind of cool but um my thinking was maybe we can do something simpler that is just a small extension to connect udp so that's what this draft is but at the end of the day like the question that i'm asking the working group the most is which direction do we want to take for browsers doing WebRTC over mask? It, do we want an extension to connect UDP or do we want to use connect IP? That's the real question for the working group. I'm going to quickly run you through. Next slide, please. Um, so um, connect UDP is great, um, but it only allows connecting one five tuple. So that works when you're only talking to one target but that doesn't work for WebRTC. Next slide, please. So let's see how this works. So the way it works today, Alice talks to the stun server. The stun server is also talking to Bob. It tells Bob Alice's address, and then Alice and Bob could talk directly. Of course, there's a lot more positive complication, but for the purpose of this, that's what matters. Next slide, please and they can have their very interesting voice call. Next slide. So now if we have a proxy in the mix that we wanna do mask with, Alice is going through the proxy for everything. The proxy talks to the stun server. The stun server tells Bob the address of the proxy. Bob talks to the proxy. Next slide, please. And they can have this time their very interesting voice call again. Next slide. So, <sighs> The feeling I got when Tommy proposed Connect IP, it was like, okay, if you look at it the right way, Connect IP is a hammer. Um, but maybe it's not the best tool for this job. Um, mainly because, uh, speaking for Chrome, we don't have a user space IP stack or user space UDP stack in there. I'm willing to bet dinner that Firefox doesn't either. Um, and I'm Top of that, you need to have every datagram carry UDP and IP headers, which is a bit silly when all you need is the UDP pay payload and some addressing information. Next slide. So we do connect UDP. It's great. Get a bundle of slides. And it's connect UDP with, that allows you to talk to multiple targets from the same source. Next slide. So how, how does it work? This part doesn't really matter because like this is sorely in the draft, but all you need to do is for the, for the path that we've had before, you send stars instead of a target when you get started to say, um, and then you have a connect UDP listen header. We should bike shut this name, but not today. Um, and then 
instead of just sending UDP payload, oh, oh yeah, this registers a context ID, uh, which was the extensibility mechanism built into Connect UDP. And then you use that context ID, and when that's present, you send your IP address and UDP port with each datagram. So when you're sending from the client, that gives you the target from the, uh, when the proxy gets it, it sends it to that target. When it gets something from a target, it puts those fields in there when it sends it to the client so it knows what the source was. Dirt simple. And that allows you to build stuff on top of it. And as usual, it's turtles all the way down. Next slide. And so discuss. Uh, I, I mainly want to hear about the this versus connect IP, but any other questions on this? Do we think this is reasonable? Um, where do we go from here? All right. I, Jonathan is first. Yep. So is this sufficient that I could run an HTTPS uh, server, HTTP3 server on my, uh, you know, and get, get incoming connections? Uh, yes. Does so that right, mean we need this for TCP also? Uh, <laughs> So that, so that would probably require an extension to regular connect as opposed to connect UDP. Mm. Um, but yeah. so I'm not particularly interested in that. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just seems like this is the sort of thing where, you know, we for property already setting, you know, as soon as any IT person in the world hears about these protocols, their hair is on fire. This is, you know, adds gasoline <laughs> to their hair. So. Yeah, thanks. That's, I hadn't thought about using it like that. That's evil. I love it. <laughs> Tommy? Um, so looking at this, I think this is simple and straightforward. And the problem with the Connect IP variant of it is that you don't really have a port allocation service. And so like you get too much um, on this. So I think this is cleaner for that regard. So I think we should just adopt it and do it. And I think it's a very nice extension. And it's actually the most compelling extension I've seen to actually use a context ID. And okay. I really want to have WebRTC work over this. Cool. Yeah, for probably similar reasons I do. <laughs> ben. Hi. Uh, so I, I do want this. I don't think it's as simple as it looks. I made some comments on the, the list about some ways in which it's uh, doing it right is going to be a little more complicated. On, uh, uh, on the point about running servers, th this thing is basically turn. And, and so we should take a good look at turn. Uh, one of the things that Turn, I believe, does is uh, make some recommendations about the kinds of NAT policy that uh, that servers ought to offer. Uh, it basically says that you should do address restricted NAT. Um, I think you know we don't need to make a strong recommendation, but we should remind people to think about NAT. No, that's that's a good point. The way I've been thinking about it in terms of WebRTC, like this doesn't do all of Turn because it doesn't tell you which public uh, address imported and assigned, but that's something we could actually encode in the, uh, in the HTTP response pretty easily if we wanted to. And then the way I think about it, it's a, I think, full code NAT. I never remember to which, which kind of NAT is which. All right. Anyway, it, it, at the end of the day, it's a NAT where you're sending stuff to your mass proxy, and it's coming out with another address, and then it's doing that mapping. Um, so, and you have just one not binding in this case, um, but it's such a way that multiple people can respond. Martin? Uh, Debbie Downer again. Um, yet another ambiguous thing in the charter, like server initiated services are out of scope. Um, that's not service yet. That's the, that's the client asking for it. Uh, that, that is just as client initiated the as the Connect UDP is. Client. So Tommy said not at the mic. This is less uh, less server initiated than Connect IP, yeah. and I have to agree. Okay. I, All right, that that's a reasonable. Like I said, I, to me, it's more ambiguous than that. But nevertheless, like I think that's valid interpretation. If like this is better than Connect IP, so like we can we can yeah. fix it. But uh, I think we'll have to consider that a little bit and see if anyone. But has that's a fair. And then uh, as soon as I drain the queue, we're going to move on to the yeah. privacy. Uh, Charter yeah. conversation. Yeah. So maybe tighten that text so that so there's no ambiguity yeah. there. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Marianne? Oh, sorry, Lucas, who's remote? Wow. Can you hear me? Yes. How are you feeling? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I, I think this extension is neat in the sense that you know it's it's a, a fairly small extension on top of something we already have that's already been running in production services for. 
worthwhile and enable something that is useful while we work on Connect UDP. It's complementary. Um, yeah, there's some technical stuff we need to sort out, but I, I would support this doing this work. Um, if it doesn't quite fit the charter as written, I think that's a great um, thing to to think about for the charter considerations. How do we how do we maintain and extend uh, drafts we uh, published or will imminently publish? Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Lucas. I fully I well, I'll, I'll state my opinions on the charter and in the charter section. Miriam? Yeah, good evening. It does feel like a nice hack to me. <laughs> and I'm, A nice yeah, what? Sorry, speak hack. closer. So, but like, I'm wondering why, like, if this is a hack, then the right solution would be Connect IP. And like, if you want port numbers, then have an extension to get port numbers on Connect IP. Like, why doesn't Connect IP give you what you want? Well, because it's oodles of complexity that are not needed. And, and trust me, if this is a hack, don't tell anyone, but all of Mask is a hack. We're proxying everything over HTTP, and we got away with it. <laughs> what, what's the additional complexity? I mean, maybe you actually want this complexity to make sure that like addresses are agreed in the right way, and you have error handling and all these things. No, but like, like, the, it, it's just a, such not the right tool for the job. Like, I don't have an IP stack in my browser. Yeah. All right. Let's let, let, let's. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I know that I, we are, because of WebRTC, we already pulled SCTP and DTLS, but you know, let's let's not add more. Anyway, Magnus. Yeah, yeah. I think the biggest one of the questions here is is, and I I think we shouldn't think too hard on the historical pre precedence here, but I mean, there, there were reasons why Turn was. Uh, Endpoint dependent filtering. You had to send to set open up towards addresses you you knew through the, the signaling. Uh, I think that's probably fine to release, uh, but just understanding that you basically open up and, and I think that's fine probably. But it's it's it, it's a change from what we've done before in this space. So that, that that's a good point, and actually yeah. that's a policy thing that we could totally say in the spec. Uh, it wouldn't change any of the encoding, but that's a good point. We should think about that and. You have more expertise than I do on turn and stun, so I, I agree. All right, that's uh, that's it for me on this one. Back to you, Eric. Thank you, David. All right, we've come to the fun part of things. So, as David noted earlier, uh, both HTTP datagrams and Connect UDP are now in the RFC editor queue. So, a huge, massive thanks to everybody here and remote. Uh, for all of the discussion and really good engagement and reviews of those documents. Um, they underwent significant evolution from their inception to where they are now, and that's awesome. So thank you all for that. You should be super proud of that. Connect IP is our last remaining item there, and we're making some pretty good progress on that. We've made good progress so far in our last two hours right here. Uh, so we're going to keep iterating on that, trying to achieve interop, close out as many of the issues as we can. And once we've got some good interop and the issues are drained, we're gonna to try to move that along in the process, which means it is now time to talk about rechartering. So in what I hope is not a super controversial statement, but let me know if it is, MASK is not intended to be a long-lived working group. So I see a thumbs up from the audience. So that means that there are places where we might extend functionality within Quick or within HTTP, and there are long-lived working groups to handle long-term maintenance of some of those things. And we're trying to talk about right now kind of what is the boundary? Where do we say we've done the initial set of things that we need for MASK and anything for maintenance beyond this can be deferred to one of the kind of more broadly scoped groups? So far, we've been thinking that anything that's super specific to proxying and to make mask actually work in the real world makes sense to do here. So we've had a lot of discussions so far in the initial kind of generic underpinnings of mask as we define them. And in as part of those discussions, we've had a number of different people propose things that we say, oh, yes, this can be done as an extension. And we want to make sure that there is a time and a space to talk about those things. And so that's kind of what we're proposing the next phase of rechartering for mask looks like. Um, as part of that, if we're going to talk about doing some of these extensions that we've brought up previously, we need to decide within our charter, do we want to explicitly name extensions? Do we want to say we're going to do a, a timestamp extension um, as a random example? 
Um, do we want to instead offer some criteria for extensions and say we want to do extensions of this type? Do we want to be completely open-ended and say we think that there's a small list of extensions that people actually need and are planning to deploy and that that's going to kind of run itself down once we get to a place where most people are you know, happy that we have a deployable thing um, and then we'll close things down. So that's something that we'd really, really like some feedback on. Uh, the core underlying principle that I think we're proposing and that I'd love to discuss right now, in addition to what kind of criteria we should lay out, um, but the, the core principle that I think we're currently going for is we want to include things in this charter that are needed to make mask actually work for real in the real world with real people. So if there's a thing that you need that is, okay, I take the core spec and I add this extension and that makes my use case that we discussed when we were first bringing up mask in our long list of different use cases, that's something that we kind of want to make sure that we address. Uh, if it's not making mask work, it's not for real people or it's not in the real world, the current proposal is that we keep that out of the next charter. That has one big asterisk next to it, which is around discovery and proxy discovery because people do kind of need to do some form of that. Sometimes that means there's a text field you type something into. Um, and so we can talk about that. So I see we have two people in the queue. We're going to open it up for hop in the queue now. This is the happy moment to express your opinions. But the things we're most interested in focusing on are first, what kind of criteria should we have for what we want to include, what is in scope for our next set of work and out of scope? Um, two, are there specific things that we need in order to make mask work in the real world that we haven't thought about? And three, is there anything from this list that we're missing? David, you're first. Thanks. And I would love to see our AD uh, in the queue to get their thoughts uh, on this at some point. Um, or then again, they can, we'll, we'll get their thoughts when we try to change the charter anyway. Um, <laughs> but so my general take on this is when you start new work, it's very important for the charter to be extremely tight. So we don't go around doing crazy things and we agree on very small set of deliverables that we get done, I would say quickly, but you know, I guess two years is quickly. Um, so we had a great charter. However, now that we're done with those branching, like deciding what we want to work on next to me should be a matter of who wants to do the work, who wants to write documents, who wants to implement this, who's going to use this. And I don't think that we need like the uh, help of the charter to scope us down that like if we tighten it too much, it, it would get in our way. So I would recommend to be very open in terms of extensions to connect UDP or connect IP are all on the table. Things like uh, discovery is on the table. Um, the uh, the, the other things you phrased as how do I make this shit work is on the table. Maybe if someone wants to write an OBS document of how do you run a fleet of mask proxies, that could be on the table. And then our gate for whether we work on something or not is the adoption call. Um, of course, I would, would like to see what the AD, the ISG has to say about that because at the end of the day, they're the ones who decide, but that would be my personal pre like preference. Tommy. All right. Um, so, I mean, I definitely think that opening up for extensions is important. Um, I agree that we should not name specific extensions. Um, I think the main reason for that is like, we just saw the first presentation about an extension on UDP listening. And I think that's very important. And like, we just got that now that does like, we will find something else and we don't want to preclude it. It may be worth mentioning in the charter, like other than just like open-ended extensions of all types, like suggested areas. And it's like some of the things that just came to mind are like, one thing we want to make sure we have enough extensions to use the extensibility points we've created, like context IDs. The UDP list one uses that, but like making sure we exercise the mechanisms we've defined is a good goal. Adding extensions to do like obvious functional proxying things like UDP listen, like this is a new functional capability of a proxy that was missing. I think that's a very obvious category. <clears throat> and then also things that make this proxying more efficient. I think that includes compression 
or we have our stuff for forwarding, but there's like things to make this stuff work faster or make sure you can do the zero RTT requests. Um, I think that's another category of good benefit. Um, since it's open-ended and we don't want this to be a forever working group, maybe one suggestion would be to have like a time box to reevaluate to say like, we will operate in this mode for two years or three, ISG can decide for how long, and then we will reevaluate how those extensions are going and decide to say, yes, this is active or like, no, these have become this trailing edge and we need to stop. But give ourselves a box. Um, with regards to discovery, I'm okay leaving it out for now because I think that is a much broader discussion than we need for this group. But I could be convinced otherwise if people are very passionate about that belonging here. But I think it's good to have a place where we can talk about the protocol bits. Well, Spencer Dawkins, um, gosh, you all are so good at generating questions before I get to the mic. Um, I want to make sure I understood um, you correctly when you were saying, uh, you, you said two things back to back and you were talking about uh, maintenance going to other working groups like, like HTTP, you know, HTTP this or, or wherever. Um, was that your, is your intention that uh, the mass specification, the mass connect specifications would go to the appropriate working group, wherever that is, for maintenance? Uh, and especially as y'all are starting to, starting to get um, deployment experience from outside the original implementer community? Yeah, so two part answer. The first part is that the line for where we draw that line yeah, is sure. something that we'd like feedback on, right? I think that's something we want to agree on as a working group. So it may be that we say, you know what, we're, we're going to keep things in mask until we've got significant, you know, outside the IETF deployment experience. So we can respond to things. Yeah. We say, no, that's okay. You know, connect and extended connect are ostensibly part of HTTP and it's okay to have an umbrella group, especially given our shared uh, constituency here and there. Um, but I think the, the long-term answer is we're, we spun up this group in part originally because we wanted to get a mix of audiences, especially as we're talking about things like IP proxying and some more transport folks there. Um, but the mechanisms themselves and some of that long-term maintenance we've been envisioning being able to route correctly, for lack of a better term, to the appropriate working groups in long-term. Thank you. My, my second comment was about um, locating things uh, and I understand that that's a mask thing for mask, but uh, if I'm understanding the conversation correctly, it was also a mock thing for mock this morning. Mm -hmm. And um, if I'm remembering correctly, we've gone through a couple of rounds of chartering working groups where you know discovery was out, you know was was out of scope. And uh, I feel like somebody's going to have to be able to discover something somehow. Um, eventually, you know, at some point. So uh, whether that happens here or somewhere else or in the right place, um, you know, that's, yeah. not, that, that would not be my call. But I would encourage people to think about uh, that more and, you know, and to support uh, proposals for putting discovery in the right place. Thank you. Thank you. All right, keep it super quick, Ben. And then Magnus, I, if you still want to talk, I, let's go. I don't think anybody knows what discovery means. Uh, and I, and, to the, and I, I think that that's probably because it doesn't actually make sense in the context of mask. You don't discover a mask server. I think configuration is important, unsurprisingly, and should be in scope. I think client authorization, is, as we've just been discussing, is important and should be in scope. Uh, I, uh, and, uh, okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Magnus. Yeah, um, not that much. I, I, I do support it. There are going to be a plethora of extensions that we need to support here and, and just try to figure out this uh, during the next, up to the next meeting, I think. Give us some time there to think about what we actually want to do. So. Sounds good. And it would be great to send notes to the list as to, hey, this is an extension we were thinking of. Uh, 30 seconds, right. I promise. Yes. Um, I, I'm, go, go, go. I'm inclined to recharter. I do not have strong convictions about the technical content of that recharter. Um, 
except that we're not, as people said, we're not chartering mask M. And um, I, I think uh, the, the key thing here is figuring out, like, I think there will be extension proposals forever. And I think we have to figure out what is the, the off ramp to hand those extension proposals to the other steward working groups here. And I, I'd be interested. I mean, I think the time box is, is like a coarse way of doing that. Um, but I think we need to figure out maybe something a little more substantive there on what our exit criteria are. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. And thank you all. Have a great rest of your evening in plenary. <laughs> yeah. Relay ops.